Well, uh, welcome along, everybody, to your uh, weekly SETI seminar series. Uh, today, we're very lucky to be joined by Rob Dunbar, who's come across to us from Stanford, uh, where he's the uh, W.M. Keck Professor of Earth Science. Uh, he's, uh, uh, Rob got a uh, BS in Geology from uh, UT Austin uh, and a uh, PhD in Oceanography from uh, UC San Diego. And his uh, research uh, revolves around uh, climate dynamics, uh, marine ecology, uh, bio biochemistry, and oceanography. He uh, was the founded, founding director of the Interdisciplinary Graduate Program in Environmental and Resources, Environment and Resources at uh, Stanford. Uh, and he's the uh, Frederick and Elizabeth Weintz University Fellow uh, in Undergraduate Education there. Uh, Rob's uh, research, as I mentioned, is uh, interested in ocean variability uh, over the past 50 to 12,000 12, years uh, and he uses skeletons of uh, deep sea corals uh, to look at uh, past climate. Uh, he's got a variety of field sites that he's been to uh, including the Galapagos, uh, Antarctica, the Line Islands, uh, Easter Islands and uh, he was just mentioning to me that he's away on uh, field work for five months of the year and he's been to Antarctica 32 times. So uh, today he's going to talk to us about uh, uh, his research in uh, climate change uh, and uh, deep sea corals. So if you'll uh, join me in welcoming Rob. Right, thanks. <laughs> thanks everybody, thanks Adrian. I, I think I can hear the overhead speakers so I'm assuming the sound's okay. Listen, I'm excited to be here. When I got up this morning, I told my high school age son, I said, I'm giving a talk at the SETI Institute, you know. I was, I, c and you just have to understand from a very early age, all I wanted to do was be an astronaut. And I tracked that, I, and I applied to be an astronaut uh, in one of the first year classes. Eventually, some of my colleagues from Scripps became astronauts. I moved to Rice University. I taught there for 17 years. I was connected with people at the space program. But I got too tall, my eyes were bad, my feet were too big. I think they make accommodations for that kind of thing now, but they didn't back then. But I've always been in love with the lore of outer space. Um, and it's kind of funny that, you know, my own kind of evolution as a scientist took me into inner space in a way, in the ocean. So I, I thought about giving a talk about deep ocean exploration today uh, and ended up reverting back to the climate change talk because I think it's a bit more mature. But if you want to hear about just some you know, fundamental new discoveries that we're making when we dive in these little three-man submersibles in the ocean. I will come back at some point. But thanks for having me here. Amazing new digs. This building's incredible. Like, there's a kitchen, there's a weight room, there's a shower. Like, Stanford ought to get with the program for this kind of thing. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about uh, climate change from the tropics to the poles. And um, just as an introduction there, you know, I'm close by. I'm eight miles away. Um, you know, there are so many scientists here and grad students here. If you guys see ways that we could collaborate or things that we might do together, um, I've listed some of the projects that are actively underway. I do a lot of work with biogeochemistry of different systems. Uh, the polar water column, we use ships like this. I have a, uh, just got funded for another two months on America's largest icebreaker where we're actually not looking at past climate change. We're trying to understand the physics of carbon dioxide uptake into the high latitude ocean. Right, so I'm interested in that kind of thing. We work on uh, the impact of CO2 levels in the ocean on coral reefs. I'll talk a little bit today about high latitude paleoclimatology, deep sea corals, you know. I think I've had five or six expeditions with Alvin or other similar submersibles and we have never once come back with fewer than four new species. We've also got two new genera. And I'll tell you what, in the deep sea when you find a new species or a genus, it's four meters tall. Right. When you find a new species on land, it's an insect from the Amazon. I mean, there's a difference in the scale here. But that, that's how little we know about life in the deep ocean. I'll talk a little bit about tropical paleoclimatology as well. And for those of you that are tech geeks, you know, we, we are working on new methodologies for doing isotopic discrimination. Um, as Adrian said, I work uh, in the field. I'm very much a field guy. Um, 
Each one of these uh, circles is a place where, where my group has worked and we've published papers on some aspect of biogeochemistry or climate change. And you can see, I, you know, I'm very much uh, Pacific focused. I actually grew up in Connecticut. You might think I'd have a natural love for the Atlantic, but honestly, in terms of the climate system, the Atlantic is but a pond. You know, the action is here in the Pacific. This map here shows sea surface temperatures and, and the warmest waters are in the Western Pacific. That's the largest pool of extremely warm water. It's above the convective limit, which means it can cause the atmosphere to do certain things. Uh, it's thick, it's extensive, it's larger than all of North America, the area that can cause the atmosphere to convect. And that compares to a really small area like that in the Atlantic. So, you know, I'm interested in what happens in the Pacific to move heat around, and therefore we have these arrays of sites along latitudinal transects. So, you know, so much of our climate system is driven by you know, one fundamental process, and that's the transfer of heat from the warmest parts of the planet to the coldest parts of the planet. And you can do some first order things with understanding climate dynamics if you know past temperature changes in the coldest parts and in the warmest parts. And I'll show you today a little bit about how we do that. So I'll give you an introduction. Um, it was prompted by this recent letter in the Wall Street Journal, so I hope it's not over the top, but I just wanted to share with you what I found remarkable about this and the follow-up uh, comments. And then I'll give you two very short stories about climate change past and present. So we'll look at coral, paleoclimate, Galapagos, some other sites, uh, not all in the Pacific, Kenya, Indian Ocean, obviously, and then we'll finish with a view of the stability of the Ross Ice Shelf. And why uh, do I think this is worth talking to you guys about? Well, the, the paleoclimate record from the ocean, it's really our best tool for understanding kind of the scope of what's natural on the planet. You know, the, one of the most often heard complaints about the theory of anthropogenic climate change is that, hey, you know, it's all natural, that we know there's large natural excursions. And uh, by studying the climate record from the ocean in particular, we can understand the magnitude and we can also understand the forcing variables and that helps us discriminate modern climate change from past climate change. Okay, so let's just start with this. These are, these are facts now, you know. It, I mean, there's a lot of facts that seem to be in play as beliefs at the moment, but these are facts. You know, climate scientists, global warming is undeniable. Uh, by that, I mean just simply the thermometer record showing that the planet's warmed up a degree centigrade. But you'll find a lot of people that take issue with that. But, but among climate scientists, that's undeniable. The same is true for atmospheric CO2. We've measured it very carefully over a number of decades. You know, the debate that exists now is over exactly how much of the temperature rise is due to man-made CO2. The best current estimate remains unchanged from over the last two or three years. There's a more than 95% probability that most of the warming, so it could be 55%, you know, something like that, but most of the warming is attributable to man's activities. So that means there's less than a 5% chance that it's not. So if, you know, if you're a CEO of a major insurance company, how are you going to play the odds, right, if you decide how to, you know, how to protect yourself against losses? And, it, and it's telling that all of the insurance companies take this very seriously. Um, the other thing that's important to keep in mind, you know, it's not so much the temperature change that we worry about. I mean, that, that'll probably be the least problematic impact that societies have to deal with. It's changes in rainfall, changes in ocean pH, and the level of the ocean. These will be the big bell ringers in the, the decades and century ahead. And it's, it's certain that water cycle perturbations, you know, the change in precipitation minus evaporation, that those will have profound effects on global economies. And then this last thing, and you know, I was reading it again in this Wall Street Journal piece, you know, th this notion that there's some kind of conspiracy among climate scientists to promote uh, global warming, it's absurd. You know, we're trained to go after each other like sharks, you know. If somebody at Harvard writes a paper <coughs> purporting to prove global warming and I can prove him wrong, I will do so immediately, right? I mean, we don't get together on these things. Okay, so here's this article. Some of you guys may have seen it. No need to panic about global warming. <laughs> There's no compelling scientific argument for drastic action. And it, it says here there's 16 authors uh, on this thing. And here's the authors. Who are they? What do they say? Uh, most of these 16 are, are well-known climate change skeptics. They've been in that camp for over a decade. Um, only one of the 16 actually has a background in climate science. Three have backgrounds in meteorology, but Honestly, the science that you use to pursue climate studies and meteorology is very, very different. Um, 
there's a geochemist, there's physicists, chemists, engineers, put this in there for you guys. There's an astronaut, an ex-Senator Harrison Schmidt, and a space plane builder, right? And so here are some of the things that they say. You know, they say that the lack of significant warming over the last 10 years proves that climate models that are, we're using to project into the future must be wrong. Um, they suggest CO2 is not a pollutant. That's kind of a semantic issue. I mean, the EPA ruled on it, but it is what it is. Um, climate gate, this was the, uh, the theft of uh, a lot of data from a uh, university in, in Great Britain and uh, revealed some email exchanges among climate scientists, and they feel that this reveals dishonest practices among climate scientists. Um, they also feel that scientists that dissent with the you know, the mainstream view about anthropogenic global warming are vilified. Uh, and here's where you can kind of see into the ideology that lies, underlies this. Climate alarmism is pursued uh, in order to fund the growth of government. And that appears in a number of different places in this letter. And furthermore, they, they cite an, econ an economist suggesting that the economy will benefit if we don't take steps to reduce CO2 emissions. Now, you know, we could spend the next 40 minutes knocking each one of these things down. I will say there's something fundamentally wrong with each and every one of those assertions. Um, and I think you'll see in a, in a few minutes what's wrong with at least some of them. Um, the climate science community fired back within four days. So 38 climate scientists respond. And, and this was a little bit shooting from the hip, you know. I, I probably would have waited a week and calmed down. But Kevin Trenberth, the lead author, you know, here's how it starts out. <laughs> Do you consult your dentist about your heart condition, you know? And you can see where it's going to go, right? He's pointing out that these people don't have the background. It's not enough to have, a, let's say, a Nobel Prize to weigh incredibly on this issue. You actually have to do a lot of hard work to get there. I thought Bert Richter at Stanford, um, I'm on a committee with him, and, and I met with him the day he wrote this letter and sent it off to the New York Times, so I had to include some of his statements. I might have waited a few days on this one, too, because some of these words are pretty harsh. But what he says, the letter of the 16 scientists, physicists, I'm sorry to say. Now, that's not completely fair, because they're not all physicists. But he, <laughs> but he is, you know, uh, says that more and more scientists doubt the dangers of global warming. That may be true of those who have not really looked at the issue, but it is certainly untrue of those that have. And just so you know my priors, I'm definitely in that, <laughs> that latter camp. And then, for, then he uh, uh, takes issue with uh, Nobel laureate Ivar Jivar, uh, who, who damns the American Physical Society's statement that the evidence for warming is incontrovertible. And Bart says, armed with my own Nobel medal, I say that if you can read a graph, the evidence is indeed incontrovertible because the temperature has gone up. And, and Ivar is actually well known for, you know, he's not just disputing the anthropogenic impact, he's saying that that we don't even know what the temperatures are from thermometers, right? And he's well published in, uh, with that point of view. So let's take a look at the instrumental record. This was just published, um, it was the day before this New York Times op-ed piece came out. It makes you wonder if the guys at NASA guess, you know, like, had some, some word that this was coming. But uh, this gets updated every year in January. It, it takes a few weeks to assimilate the tens of thousands of thermometer records from the previous year. So now we know the global average temperature from 2011, and there it is. It's, it's not the warmest year. I, you know, maybe it's the one, two, three, four, five, seventh or eighth warmest year. Um, but this record goes all the way back to 1880. Uh, there's a semi-arbitrary zero point, so these are anomalies. But the main thing you can see here is temperatures risen from the late 1800s to 2010, about one degree centigrade. It's not constant, there's, it's kind of flat at the beginning, there's a warming period from 1910 to 1940, it's flat again for 25 years, and then from 1970 or so, it warms up again. There's a lot of interannual variability, it's on the order of 0.2 degrees centigrade, maybe 0.3 in extreme cases, and some of this inter, interannual variability is actually decadal variability. That's what's normal, or that's, I shouldn't say that's what's normal, that's what we observe in this particular record. Yeah. Question, this plot, I mean, th this is the average temperature over a whole bunch of points on the entire surface, the ocean, the yes. land, I mean, what are we plotting here? Yeah, these, okay, the index um, comes from uh, kind of infilling of tens of thousands of instrumental records from specific MET stations on land and from uh, tens of thousands of measurements in the ocean of, of ships that are constantly measuring temperatures as they move across the ocean. The same site, if you go to the NASA GIST site, you know, the very next figure shows just the temperature record from, you know, without any infilling or, you know, any significant processing, what does 
the temperature record from the MET stations tell you, and it looks identical to that. You know, um, I mean, there, there are corrections in here. One of the, in fact, the next slide's going to address that. You know, uh, it's been very popular among the community that doubts this data. And, and before we move on, I mean, let me just say, you know, the long-term trend here is what we care about with respect to a greenhouse gas effect. It's not whether one year is warmer or colder than another or whether a group of five years is somehow a little bit different. You know, it's the, it's the decadal trend. And I, and I would submit that, you know, that having a... <laughs> a few years where we're not jumping up quite as much as we were here at the very end doesn't take away from the observation that there's a strong multi-decadal trend towards warming here. You know, this is the warmest decade, right? The last decade is the warmest decade and, and you know, all, all of these years are records relative to everything else in the previous 120 years. I mean, that's what we can say about it. Now, some people that dispute this suggest that, well, the thermometer record is heavily biased by the urban heat island effect. One of the most prominent in recent years saying that was Richard Mueller, a physicist over at Berkeley, and he started on a project. He said, look, you know, I'm just going to, I'm not going to start with what NASA has or NOAA or any of the overseas uh, thermometer shops, you know. I'm going to collect the raw data myself and just have a look at it, and I'm going to, I'm going to look at it, removing all the urban stations, see if it looks any different, and that'll address the urban heat island effect. And that's what you see here, you know. The, this is annual land surface temperature now, so it doesn't include the ocean, but it includes data from NASA, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, the, the British Hadley, Hadley Center, and then Berkeley is the Berkeley Earth Surface Temperature Project, and they've, they started to release their data uh, just in the last four months. And um, I mean, basically what you can see is they all, they all show the same thing. There, there are no significant differences. In fact, the Berkeley data set, which I think Richard said it's derived from 1.6 billion temperature measurements. Um, the Berkeley data set actually shows larger warming than, than the other three. And, and he, I, in my opinion, very conclusively showed that the urban helon effect is extremely minor. You know, it doesn't influence this record. Yep. So given this rise in temperature across the entire surface, uh, does anybody talk about or does it make any sense to talk about what this represents in terms of total energy yeah there, yeah we you know there's a whole series of papers on that and because you're generating this excess heat actually the majority of it gets stored in the ocean right I mean you can warm the atmosphere up from long wave but radiative so effects the yeah that's been done no I don't know the exact number it is a big number and and the thermodynamics ha has been calculated uh, but, it, you know, the latest estimate is it's somewhere around 90% of, of the heat that's been, excess heat that's been generated, you know, since 1910, 1920 or so has ended up in the ocean. And that's really important because, you know, the ocean then it acts like a flywheel. Like, it's absorbed a lot of heat. I mean, even if we did something dramatic right now that caused heat absorbance in the atmosphere to decrease, you know, then what's going to happen is, well, the ocean will kick in and, and supply some of that stored heat back to the atmosphere. That's, why, that's one of the reasons I work in the ocean. I'm intrigued by that angle. Uh, you know, this record also, the Berkeley crowd said, you know, there, isn't that, there aren't that many thermometers in the early 1800s, but there's some, so let's include that, which the other outfits didn't do. So, you know, the longer context from the earliest 1800s where there arguably is no significant man-induced effect, you know, I believe that I've worked on the Little Ice Age before. Um, you know, that's hovering down here around minus one, and then we're two degrees centigrade warmer than that. And, and uh, that's what the coral records show us. And I actually use that as kind of a natural experiment. And we'll walk through that here in just a moment. OK, so what are the candidates saying? I'm sorry, I had to put this in. Because uh, this was on TV over the weekend, right? And, uh, and it was actually, it was, I think, right before the Super Bowl. Anyway, there was a reason that I was watching TV on a Sunday. So um, Rick Santorum, about, he was asked about, what do you think about global warming? And, and of course, the reporter knew what the answer was going to be. He was just hoping to get a juicy quote like this, and he got one. I, for one, never bought the hoax. I, for one, understand just from the science that there are 100 factors that influence climate. Uh, to suggest that one minor factor of which man's contribution is a minor factor in the minor factor is the determining ingredient in the sauce that affects the entire warming and cooling is just absurd on its face. I mean, well. 
<coughs> I'm stunned by that, you know, first admitting the complexity of the system and then somehow implying that if there's 100 factors, they all play an equal role, you know, like how do we know this one factor is minor? Uh, Newt Gingrich was somewhat more nuanced. I don't believe we know. Uh, I'm an amateur paleontologist. I like that part. Uh, <laughs> the planet has changed its temperature a number of times. If you look at the Antarctic today, you'll figure it must have been a lot warmer when the dinosaurs were there. And like, you know, Stephen Picard spoke to this group about four or five weeks ago, I think, sometime in the recent series, and uh, he talked about Antarctica. And, and the funny thing about this statement is, you know, Newt's absolutely right here. We think that, um, well, in, it, certainly in the coastal areas of the Antarctic, during the late Cretaceous, temperatures might have been around 15, 16 degrees centigrade. You know, that's what the kind of fossils there would indicate. But the main reason that we think it was that way was from CO2. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was high CO2 that drove that scale of warming, and that's one of the data points we use to, to think about climate sensitivity. You know, how much warming do you get per unit CO2 rise in the atmosphere? So anyway, as the folks in Yale at the Center for Climate Change Communication uh, discovered in November, you know, Americans generally are very poorly informed about climate change, and that extends to our political candidates as well, in both parties to be fair. Um, there's a very significant knowledge gap between what's understood by the science community and what's known by the public. Um, this Yale group administered a, a pretty straightforward climate test to a thousand people ostensibly chosen at random, but I don't know how many people randomly volunteered to take a test. Anyway, uh, this group, they were asked questions like, you know, What's the greenhouse effect? Uh, does CO2 absorb heat energy? That kind of thing. And 52% of the people failed the exam, right? And, and only about 10% of America self-identifies as moderately comfortable with the science behind climate change. And you know, that's what leads to this problem here, that facts are in play as though they are opinions. The real, this is the, this is the main question to focus on. I mean, the, the reason for us to do things that hurt our economy you know, that cause us to tighten our belts or really invest in, in, in renewable energies in a way that doesn't make immediate economic sense, you know? I mean, the answer to this has to be yes. And, and there's several issues in play there. One is climate inertia. I mentioned that already with respect to ocean heat storage, but there are a lot of other things that, that impart inertia to the climate system. There's a lot of warming in the pipeline already, you know, at least another degree centigrade if we stopped CO2 levels where they are today. And this issue of tipping points as a paleo scientist, you know, I mean, that's more of the, the rule rather than the exception. You know, the climate's cooling down a little bit and bang, all of a sudden it changes really fast. The climate's warming up a little bit and bang, all of a sudden it changes really fast. I mean, that is what the geological and oceanographic record tells us about climate. So, you know, we just don't know where those are. Um, but that's where we would see the kinds of rapid changes that I think anybody would be convinced are deleterious to people and to our economies. But there is some good news, you know, it really isn't too late. I mean, you know, it can always be worse, <laughs> right? Which means it can always be better. And, and of course, energy solutions have multiple other benefits. Um, that's it for the intro. Uh, now I wanted to talk about natural variability and some of the ways that we study it. You know, there's a whole bunch of natural causes of climate change, and they're all really interesting. There's air-sea interactions. I worked quite a few years on El Nino. Well, I'll mention that in just a moment. Um, volcanoes shoot off, you know, mostly at random, but sometimes there's kind of clumps of volcanic events, and, and volcanoes eject aerosols and dust. Depending on where that material is, it can cause the planet to either cool down or warm up, usually in a very heterogeneous fashion, different temperature changes in different places. Uh, ocean circulation, you know, there was this movie called The Day After Tomorrow, uh, starring uh, in the sky, the lead character was a paleoclimatologist. I thought that was pretty cool. And, uh, well, he was, he was speculating in the movie that, you know, the, that the North Atlantic conveyor was shutting down and it caused mega tornadoes in Los Angeles and it, temperatures dropped to minus 100 degrees in Britain, that kind of thing. I mean, that's over the top, obviously, but, you know, but we do know from ice core records and from ocean records that that this huge ocean circulation system that moves heat and salt around the globe, that it does speed up and slow down. And when it does so, there are climatic consequences that in some cases are really big, really important. So that's natural variability. And of course, we know that the sun's output is not constant, that it does vary over a variety of timescales. Now, there's also human-induced causes of climate change, right? There's 
changes in land use that, that can impact the reflectivity of the surface of the earth. Uh, there's our own aerosols of different kinds from industry. And then we influence trace gases, not just carbon dioxide, but methane, ozone, oxides of sulfur and nitrogen. So here's the thing. When, when President Bush Jr., uh, in his first year in office, he assembled this blue ribbon panel to come together and answer questions about climate change. And uh, this is like 13 or 14 questions. Ralph Cicerone chaired this panel. And one of the questions was seemingly very simple. It was, is man-made CO2 causing the planet to warm up? Now, it, it sound, it's, it's definitely something you want to know. It sounds pretty simple, but think about what you have to know to answer that. You, know, you have to know that this one component uh, is doing something uh, when you also know all these other things. Like there are all these other changes going on in land use, aerosols, uh, these other trace gases. There's all the, the natural events, uh, natural causes of climate change as well. So it took this group um, quite some time. I think they deliberated and for six, seven months they read thousands of papers. And at the end of the day, they came back and they said, Mr. President, you know, the balance of evidence very strongly supports the notion that man-made CO2 is causing the planet to warm up. And, and Bush accepted that and, and, and actually gave a, a, a press conference that wasn't very well covered in my opinion, but he said, look, you know, this is what the science tells us now, we're just going to have to learn how to deal, right? So, and that then set in motion the Bush policies for the next seven years. It's easy to forget that, you know, this issue has been visited in so many ways by so many different groups. And you look at what's out there today and, it, you know, you'd almost think, oh, people are just now discovering there's a debate on this topic. <laughs> okay, as I said, one of the most often um, mentioned reasons why we shouldn't buy into the, the scientific consensus view uh, is that natural climate variability may be at play. Um, one of the reasons that we can discriminate among natural variability and uh, all of its manifestations in these all these different uh, managed things is that, you know, there are papers written about every single one of those different forcing factors, and a lot of that uh, information comes from the study of these archives. So uh, there's historical documents. There's actually a record of the level of the Nile River going back almost 3,000 years. It was used by the pharaohs initially to set tax rates. It's called the Nilometer, right? The Nilometer tells you something fundamental about climate change. The Chinese records go back. Uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years. We also use tree rings. I'll show you some data from sediments, also from corals, and you're probably aware of some of the amazing work that's been done on these ice cores from the Antarctic. Okay, so what about that hockey stick? I don't know if you guys are, I mean, in my field, people think about the hockey stick all the time, and it's been written about a lot. Uh, it was criticized. Uh, after climate gate, a number of folks said, well, these email exchanges indicate that people fudge the data and produce something that looked like a hockey stick. The hockey stick is simply this. This is year at the bottom, 2,000 years. Here's temperature, and there's lots of natural variability here. There's many different records that are shown here in the different colors, and then uh, the instrumental records here at the end, and, and this is the blade of the hockey stick, and here's the handle, right? That's where the hockey stick name comes from. But uh, I have to say, you know, it's withstood the test of time. I mean, uh, you know, in 1999, when the first hockey stick was published, you know, it took a few years for other scientists to say, well, I don't know if I believe that. I'm going to jump in there and do my own separate analysis, sometimes using completely ind independent indicators. Uh, but now we've got over 25 peer-reviewed studies that have done that in one way or another. And, and uh, you know, here's what you can pick out from this. There's a lot of natural variability in the climate system. It's not one degree centigrade. Over 2,000 years, it's on the order of maybe 0.2 to 0.4 degrees centigrade. Uh, there are natural intervals like uh, 1,000 years ago where it's uh, a little bit warmer than normal or than the average. There's periods where it's a little bit colder and the difference there might be 0.4 degrees centigrade. But all of this is different from what's happened in the last century, where we've, we see temperatures for the last 30, 40 years that are above the highest temperatures experienced uh, on the globe for the last 2,000. You know, and, that, and that still stands, right? You'll, you'll read about people disputing this, but scientifically, in the peer-reviewed literature, this still stands. Okay, so now, take you on a voyage. This is Easter Island. I'm sure an audience this side, some of you guys have been uh, touring at Easter Island. Easter Island has very large coral heads um, they wouldn't let us drill the biggest one because it was the biggest one. It's called the Captain Cook Coral. So this is the second biggest coral <laughs> at Easter Island. It's about six meters tall. 
and it started growing about 600 years ago. So we treat this thing kind of like the ice core community teach, treats their ice cores. We, we pull out these chunks of limestone, their cylinders of limestone, and bring them back to the surface. I do this kind of work for about a month every year. We just came back from uh, American Samoa, where we drilled what's thought to be the largest coral colony on Earth. So here are these little uh, tubes. And the nice thing about Easter Island is you can also collect samples from the volcanoes. This is a volcanic caldera. So water falls in by rainfall and it evaporates back out, so it's like a bathtub. And we're walking on a lake here. The water here is about 15 meters deep, but it's covered by a mat of algae and grass that you can actually walk on, right? I mean, if you stand still, you'll sink through it. But we're, um, we cased the hole, and now we're putting down this special Russian-made coring system. Um, the Russians make really good lake cores. And, uh, and we come back with a record of the sediment this red, stinky sediment. And the nice thing about this, the coral record offshore tells us something about water temperatures. And then these sediments from the lake tell us something about the salinity of the lake, which tells us, you know, was the lake drying up because it wasn't raining, or was it overflowing because it was raining so much? So we can put those two kinds of records together. That's a little example of the field work. A lot of what we do is pretty primitive, I have to say, out in the field. But, you know, the simpler it is, the less likely it is to break. Um, okay, back to the coral. So when we get these tubes of limestone back to the lab, we cut them up and x-ray them. Now we're using CAT scan image technologies, but we used to use just conventional x-rays. These guys grow about a centimeter a year, and, and most tropical corals have annual growth bands. There's a dark band, a light band, a dark band, a light band. Each couplet is one year, and there's some biological reasons for that. Um, they're very high fidelity chronometers, so you can count your way on down from the top. In some cases, we've counted back into the 1400s, and five different people can do the counts, and they come out with the same number every time. I mean, you know, there isn't much uncertainty there. So we have an advantage over many other kinds of natural archives of climate change in that our clock is really good, right? It's like a tree ring, in a sense. Um, there's all kinds of stuff you can do here. There, this is, you know, a year from one dark band to another, and the distance changes. Sometimes there's subannual bands. So it's actually our lunar monthly band. So we actually can, you know, we can get down to the 28-day cycle in these things. And that reflects, you know, the corals are aware of the amount of light, even in the middle of the night, hitting them because it controls the abundance of food, right? And they respond physiologically. So we can get some subannual um, chronology out of this as well. But we can also measure the mass of carbonate that's produced, and, and it does appear right now that we're starting to see some reductions in calcification um, in the last couple of decades in many parts of the ocean. We can also see fish bites, and you know, people have quantified the number of fish bites per decade, and you can see the loss of larger fish as we fish down the food chain, right? It's all kinds of things going on. But I'm going to talk about isotopes, the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16. Stephen Picard spoke about this and gave you a little tutorial uh, some weeks ago, but the bottom line is that as temperatures rise, and for, this is for some pretty straightforward uh, crystal physics and thermodynamic uh, reasons, as temperatures rise, the carbonate that's produced has an in, a decrease in the ratio of O18 to O16. Uh, as salinities rise, uh, the ocean uh, O18 to O16 ratio tends to rise, and that signal gets incorporated into the coral. So what are some of the things that we might be able to do then? Um, what are some predictions of global warming that we can test using coral records? And, and the way I look at that, you know, is we think the planet was really quite cold in the early 1800s, and it's warmed up about two degrees centigrade over the last two centuries. Only part of that is man-induced, maybe 25 percent, you know, that would be my current guess. Um, you know, and that's going back 200 years. But, you know, one of the predictions is that more warming will cause more frequent El Ninos, that we'll see an intensification in the trade winds. That'll cause the eastern Pacific, Galapagos, to be cooler. Uh, another prediction is that the tropical hydrological cycle will ramp up, that we'll see a lot more rainfall in tropical regions. So, you know, we can test all of these things, and I'll, and I'll show you an example from each of these. So, first, the El Nino. Uh, Axel Timmerman used a, a complex simulation of the ocean and atmosphere, a model, to produce this result that he published in Nature. Uh, 11 years ago, and he, it says increased El Nino frequency in a climate model forced from greenhouse warming. And so we did a, a coral project in the Galapagos Islands to address this. 
So there's the Galapagos. I'm sure a number of you guys have been there as well. We'll go to this side on the west coast of the biggest island there, which is called Isabella. And you can see here, um, this, was this photo was taken by Kathy Sullivan on a shuttle mission. So she and I were doing a project together. Uh, actually, in this case, we were working on superposition of different lava flows, right, to figure out relative activity of these different volcanoes. But, but it also shows this study site beautifully there. So this is Volcan El Cedo, Fernandina, Tagus Cove is right there. If you guys have been there, Punta Espinosa. So right here at the boundary between this light lava and dark lava is that little white spot. That's actually a coral reef. Um, this coral reef was uh, started out, it wasn't there as a white thing. It, it was uh, covered by the ocean before 1954, but in April 1954, there was a large uh, uh, eruptive event and earthquake, and that lifted up about eight square kilometers of coral community. And actually, you know, it's, it's a reef in some areas. So if you fly over this thing today, that's what it looks like. It's black volcanic rock. There's the boundary between the light lava and the dark lava. And there it is, carbonate sand with a bunch of corals in it, right? Perfect place to take your students on a field trip to look at the ecology of a coral reef without anybody having to get wet. The problem is it's really hot. You know, it's like being in this reflecting pan. <laughs> it's like being in, in uh, Death Valley in the middle of summer when you're working out there with all this white rock around. But here's one of these really big corals. That one's 11 meters in diameter. Uh, this coral also has those growth bands I've showed you. We excavated and brought back about 1,000 pounds of this coral. I have it over at Stanford if anybody wants to see it. Uh, this coral, as far as we know, started growing in the year 1582, right? That's made from counting bands from the year 1954, the year of death, back to uh, the oldest rings we can find in the center. So then we apply the isotopic technique. We always do calibration studies, so uh, we went out and, and put in, into the water these thermometers that record temperature every hour for several years. Uh, we had fishermen going out using a metabolic stain to mark the corals so that when we harvest these living corals, these are living corals now in the marine part of the uplift, it's the part that is still underwater. Um, when we harvest the corals and sample them, we can line up, line up carbonate powder that formed at a particular time, and then we know what the temperature was. So here's this, this measure that we use, oxygen isotopic ratio, over a two-year period against instrumental temperature recorded actually right next to the coral. And you can see, I mean, it's a perfect match. These guys share. 95% of their variance in common, and, and the 5% that isn't in common is an analytical error in the isotopic measurement. I mean, this thing is an instrumental quality paleo thermometer. So then when we go back through time and produce a record like this, and I'll walk you through this, this is the isotopic ratio on annual, the entire annual band cut out, crushed up, and analyzed. You know, we interpret this as telling us the annual average temperature in the Galapagos. Now in the Galapagos, now the annual temperature is controlled by the state of the El Nino, La Nina cycle. I mean, that dominates over everything else. So all of these kind of numbers down on the bottom here, the peaks that trend to the bottom are La Nina events. All the ones up top are, are El Nino events. And um, this is a, kind of a, a bandpass filter that highlights some of the decadal variability. One of the first things you'll notice is that it's cold in the early 1600s, that's Little Ice Age time, but you know, really, for the last two or three centuries, there, there's no evidence here of dramatic warming. And that's absolutely true. You know? But remember, and this isn't inconsistent with global warming ideas, you know, one of the ideas that's associated with global warming is that, you know, the planet warms up, you've got to move more heat around more quickly, the trade winds intensify, and in the eastern Pacific, the trade winds are what, they keep that ocean cold, right? They produce upwelling effects, they strip away more heat out of the ocean through evaporation. So, you know, it, at this location, this result is consistent with warming elsewhere. But then we can address this question, are there more El Ninos or not? I mean, it's pretty easy to do. You can count the number of El Ninos per uh, decade, and, or you can do it more uh, statistically, which is what we've done here. But this, this simply shows the periods at which variance is concentrated, so the return time of of El Nino in this case, the return time, and how that return time has changed through the centuries. So here we are in the 1600s, here we are in the mid-1900s, and you can see prior to about 1800, uh, there's no color here until you get up to about four and a half to six years. Uh, that was the beat of El Nino back then, you know? 
Before about 1800, El Nino's uh, recurred every, every five to six years. But then once you get up into the mid-1800s and on into the 20th century, it snaps on down to 3.4 years. And that is the average return time of ENSO today, right? So, you know, the periodicity of El Nino has changed. It's, it can be linked to global temperatures. We would say this, this is a case where, you know, we would agree with that modeling result that if you look at the two degree warming that's occurred on the planet since the year 1800, it has been accompanied by a change to more frequent El Ninos, right? So maybe that means we give more credence to Axel Timmerman's model now because it passes a test that we just applied, right? Oh yeah, so there's all, you know, so, I actually wrote a couple of papers about the impact of the uh, solar cycle. There's actually some 22-year periodicity in here that's pretty strong. And uh, I did get criticized, you know, because there was no clear mechanism for that. And I went back to do some other analyses to really try to find out, is there a significant variability and does it line up phase and phase space with any known records of solar variability? And, you know, it's intriguing. It looks like it might, but it doesn't pass the 95% confident test, test. So at the moment, that remains strong um, decadal variability of unknown origin. And if I had to take a guess, it's, um, it's internal to the ocean, that it's uh, sub-thermocline um, transfer, you know, in the upper, upper part of the ocean, but just at the base of the thermocline. Uh, but that's, you know, that's kind of frontier area. Like the climate dynamics community, they kind of feel like they've wrapped El Nino up in a, in a box and put a bow on it, and now they're moving on to the origin of decadal variability. And then we're plugging in with that community. But right now, that's mostly unresolved. If you have a periodicity at 3.4 years, wouldn't you expect there to be periodicities at multiples of 3.4? In other words, two times Yeah, two there are, you know, the five, different... Five, five, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't think it's a multiple in this case because this really, the variance here is quite strong, but the way these, these analyses emanate from a kind of a multi-taper method and there's a, a, a technique to remove the harmonics that come out of that, and so that, that is done here, but, but you're absolutely right, you know, and that does plague the discrimination of what's the prime signal versus multiples for, particularly for really weak signals, like in the Galapagos, temperature is not a weak signal, I mean, it, you know, temperature changes a lot, and it's always only you now. And uh, we're kind of lucky there, but other sites, it's more problematic. Um, okay, so Palau, this is work that we've been doing. We're doing it right now. In fact, we're, we just sent a new manuscript in on this last week. The idea was to work in the Western Pacific where temperature changes are not very large, but there are big changes in rainfall. So the, uh, we, the expectation was that the coral isotopic record is mainly a function of of salinity. And that's, that's borne out by the calibration work that we've done. This uses a, a record of salinity from Koror in Palau and then Delta 018 on a coral. This is going back about 50 years where we're doing the calibration. You know, it's, it's not perfect. 50% of the variance is shared there, but it's, it's much stronger for salinity than temperature. That means Delta 018 in the coral is recording salinity of the ocean much more than it records temperature. So then when we look at some of these long records, we're back into the late 1700s now. Um, the, the gray is, is this monthly data. So we sample these corals every millimeter, and actually I think our average time spacing is about two weeks, but so this is quasi-monthly resolution in gray and then the annualized data in black. And you can see there's a long-term trend. You can see that you know, the last 20 or 30 years are are uh, generally above the long-term mean. I mean, there's an occasional year here, 1824, 1843, I think it is, that are getting up there. But there's a whole bunch of those years here, and that makes the annualized record um, you know, be above the mean. Now, this actually looks a lot like the global instrumental temperature record that we looked at. You know, this is really cold stuff in the early 1800s. Uh, then it warms up a little bit, then it warms uh, a fair amount in the, um, 1910 to 1940. It goes neutral for a while, or declines even a little bit, and then it jumps up again at the end. So I mean, there's a lot of coherence between this record of salinity in the ocean and the global temperature record. And it's not just at this one site. If we look at a similar record published by a Japanese group from Guam, you know, there's some differences year to year, but both of these records show the same amount of, of uh, decrease in, in the isotopic composition of the coral over the same time scale. 
So what do we conclude from that? Well, you know, the only way to resolve this right now <coughs> is by invoking increased rainfall in the tropics. And it's, and it's been steadily increasing for the last 200 years as the planet warms up and, and with a kind of a bump after about 1970. So, you know, the global warming at the beginning is not due to man, it's due to the kind of recovery out of the Little Ice Age. But then towards the end, this is when we see man-made effects come into play. But it doesn't matter whether it's natural or man-induced, it's having the same impact on rainfall in the far western Pacific. And a lot of people live in the western Pacific, right? This is a very densely populated part of the planet. You know, you think of 100 million people living on Java. Okay, the last coral uh, story that I'll tell comes from uh, Malindi in East Africa. Uh, we first got interested in this site because we were trying to understand mega droughts. Uh, there was a, a scientist in Europe that they published this paper on rainfall and drought in equatorial East Africa over the last 1,100 years. And, and he worked in, uh, Lake, how many of you guys have been to Lake Naivasha in Kenya? It's the Flamingo Lake. Somebody must have been there. It's where that really horrible wine comes from in Kenya. I mean, it's just awful. But that's the wine growing district in Kenya. And, and that's a closed basin lake. You know, the, there's rivers coming in, but no rivers going out. And so when it stops raining or when it evaporates more, that lake can dry up. And so Dirk Bershuren went there and took some sediment cores. And you can tell when it dries up, you see the salt deposit, right? And there's no more regular lake sediment. And so we found out that the lake does dry up periodically. So here's the depth of the lake. It's around 18, 20 meters today. But there were times when it was much deeper and times when it absolutely dried up. And these correspond to uh, what we call mega droughts. This comes from the oral and written history of East Africa. Most of it's pre-colonial. But the oral history has these ages of prosperity that are separated by these mega droughts. And during these mega droughts, these are times when very large percentages of the population just died off. I mean, it stopped raining. And it stopped raining not just for one, two, two or three years. It stopped raining for 50 years, for 100 years. So we're interested in the most recent mega drought, where it really stopped raining for uh, 65 years, this Loparnarat drought. And uh, we haven't seen anything like this since colonial history began, right? But we know these things are out there. I mean, the population has exploded in East Africa since then. So here's one of these isotopic records from a coral. Again, this is submonthly, which is the blue would be monthly, uh, submonthly isotopic measurements, and then the red is annualized. So we go back into the late 1600s here, and you can interpret this one as temperature. This is a site where the coral is very much temperature sensitive. There's one degree centigrade. So you can see from the coldest period in the 1700s to today, the temperatures have risen about 2 to 3 degrees centigrade. Uh, and I will point out, you know, the temperatures of the last uh, decade, decade and a half or so, and this record ends in 1990, so it's 1980 to 1996. I mean, all of these greatly exceed anything else in the previous, you know, 300 years. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we think today really is anomalous. Um, but what's going on here during the drought? Well, this isotopic record tells us that the ocean was cold, that, that this interval of the drought is defined by the lakes in East Africa, also coincides with the coldest temperatures indicated by the coral, and that these cold conditions were maintained for about 70 years. So I mean, that would seem, to, it seems to us, you know, this is the, cause, the proximate cause of the drought. You know, if you've been to East Africa or you've climbed to Kilimanjaro, I led a group of Stanford alumni to the top of Kilimanjaro three years ago in parts so that we could camp on the summit and have a look at the glaciers. And, you know, you stand up there. If you camp there overnight, you can be up at dawn and just watch what happens. And you look off to the, to the east over the Indian Ocean and, you know, the equator is right there. I mean, you can just see this moisture boiling up out of this cauldron of hot water and creating these clouds. You know, what causes that moisture to boil up into the atmosphere where it can then be transported to the continent and fall in rain, you know, it's the heat of the ocean. And so if you drop the ocean temperatures down two or three degrees centigrade, and particularly if you go below the convective limit, you know, then you're going to immediately cut off uh, the transfer of moisture into the atmosphere. So, I mean, that seems to be the proximate cause, but the, the big mystery still is, you know, what can possibly cause the equatorial ocean to become cold like that for 65 years. And I, and I wouldn't lay this at, you know, it's not something being caused by man's activities. We can't think of anything man was doing in the 1700s that would have caused this. But here's why it's important in the context of global warming. You know, this is a climate surprise. Something happened, maybe it was cooling down from some natural process, and then it got stuck in a cold phase. And 
it stopped raining in East Africa. You know, 200 million people live in East Africa today. Now, we don't think we're much at risk for this right now because if you know, we're going the opposite direction, but, but the point of the climate surprise is still there. You know, these things happen in both directions, good and bad. Okay, I'm gonna zip through this part on soil erosion um, and I'm gonna spend just five minutes or so talking about some work that's going on in the Ross Sea. Um, that'll take us to one o'clock, and I, if some of you guys have to get back to work, you know, it's your lunch hour, and you've chosen to spend it here with me, then just get up and go. I won't be offended, I'll know exactly what's going on. Uh, for the rest of you, I'll probably talk, I'll probably go another six or seven minutes, and then I'll take questions, and I'll stay as long as you guys have questions. Okay, this is the Ross Ice Shelf. Um, I've been, uh, my very first trip to the Antarctic, 1981, I visited this thing, I've actually landed on the very edge there on helicopters and deployed instruments off that ice shelf. The distance here is, uh, it's on the order of 30 meters or so. It's hard to tell, right? It looks like a big piece of white chocolate. Uh, it's beautiful, and it goes on like this for about 800 miles. Uh, it's the largest piece of floating ice on the planet. It's about the size of France. And uh, we organized a project in 2006 called Andrill, Antarctic Drilling. Stanford's been one of the proponents and a, and a key player in doing some of the science here, but we've had a, you know, it's New Zealand, Italy, Germany, uh, Britain was involved, it's like that joke, you know. <laughs> anyway, we made sure to have the, our chef was from Italy. Um, <laughs> so, but, you know, really good scientists from all the countries contributed. And the way it works is like this. So here's the Ross Ice Shelf, here's Antarctica, it's this part of Antarctica here towards New Zealand. Here's this big piece of floating ice, the South Pole's up here somewhere. There's a big volcano, Mount Erebus there. There's another island over here. These islands act as pinning points. They kind of trap the Ross Ice Shelf against their uh, pole side faces. And, uh, and the idea is if, you know, if the ice shelf is at the pinning point, then we've got a West Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, as soon as you start to lose some of this ice here, which is, which is where the glaciers are flowing in to create the Ross Ice Shelf, if you have something going on over here that removes ice, this thing will uh, start to retreat, and if there's no pinning points, then it can all break up, and you might expect it to retreat all the way back to the grounding line, to the coastline there. And uh, so on that, that idea, we, it, it took five years to convince other scientists that we should get $20 million to do the drilling, but we set up a drill rig on the ice right there. And so here's the, you know, we've got physical models, very complex simulations. This one's from Rob DeCanto and David Pollard, but you know, we did these before we went into the field to show, you know, how does the ice shelf here, this is the Antarctic Peninsula, so South America's up here, here's Ross Island, and uh, how does the ice shelf retreat when it starts to warm up? I think only two degrees centigrade was causing the ice to decay here, and after 2,500 years, you know, there's an open seaway. West Antarctica is now a, an archipelago of islands with a large seaway in between. When that happened, sea level rose by about six meters, right, so. So that's a big impact. It's about the same amount of sea level rise that you would get from the melting of Greenland. So we drilled in a moat. We've got this big active volcano forming here, and as the volcano grows, it pushes down on the sea floor and creates a moat around it. That's where the sediments fall in. Good place to drill. And there's the drill rig itself. It's covered with a little tent. It looks kind of like the airport in Denver, you know? And I mean, you know, drillers, they're a very delicate group of individuals, oil drillers, so you gotta keep them warm and comfortable. And uh, they're working inside this tent with uh, this kind of very clean uh, drill rig, diamond drilling system. We uh, drilled through the ice shelf, so we had to keep the ice shelf from freezing up against the, the drill string. Um, and a lot of work was done on site. There's a whole bunch of scientists working together with the engineers and the, the drillers to to bring these cores up and have a look. And so what did we find? Well, we drilled through almost 100 meters of glacial ice and through almost a kilometer of water column and then over 1,000 meters into the seabed. I think it's 1,200 and some odd meters. And you gotta keep in mind, you know, this ice is moving. In some places, it's moving two meters a day. <laughs> you know, so you can't linger when you're drilling. You gotta get in and get out fast. Um, but at the end of the day, you see something like this. Uh, this is a representation of the upper 500 meters of a 1,200 meter sediment record. And you know, I'll show you pictures of this, kind of the glacial sediments and then the sediments that form in open water. And those are the two different facies that we saw. 
Uh, when you have sediments that are forming under the ice, it looks like this. You know, there's very little biological material there because it's dark. Uh, it also contains gravel, sand, pebbles, sometimes even boulders. Ice is an equal opportunity mover of stuff. You know, the ice doesn't care whether it's carrying a boulder or a grain of sand. It carries all of those things out into the deep sea and drops them. Wind and water do not do that. They always fractionate sediments by grains. But when you see this, it's very clearly a glacial origin. And that alternates with sediments like this. These sediments are almost 100% the remains of <laughs> algae, the shells of microscopic algae. And uh, those guys need sunlight. You cannot have a thick mass of ice overhead. So I mean, the, you know, a lot of the insights that came from this project, you can see right away as the drill core arrived up, you know, you can see, oh, it's open water, it's covered with ice. It's open water, it's covered with ice. We actually didn't expect it would be that straightforward. Uh, but here's a cartoon of what we think is happening. There's times when you have an ice shelf attached to a grounded ice sheet. There's the drill rig, and it creates glacial sediments. Uh, there's times when the ice advances out over the drill site, and it erodes stuff away, but it also impacts and imparts uh, overpressure to the sediments and leaves the sediments with an ice burdened type texture. And then there's times when we're back like this again, and times when it's open water and you get this plant layer that forms. And you can imagine over time, it builds up like this, you know, ice shelf, grounded ice, open ocean, ice shelf, grounded ice, open ocean. And uh, so that's what we see is this alternation. And here's the pay dirt and I'm almost done. You know, what we found was that the Ross ice shelf, it melted away and it formed anew uh, up to 38 times in the past 5 million years. Now what we think is that the ice of West Antarctica melted back uh, completely or nearly so at least 10 times. And each time that happened, sea level would have gone up globally 6 meters, 6 meters. Um, now did man cause this? Absolutely not. Th th these were natural changes, part of the cyclical natural changes. But we do have a pretty good idea of what the temperature changes were and the CO2 changes. So, and here's what they are. How much did the temperature change? About three to four degrees centigrade. So, you know, not much above where we are today. And here's the kicker, you know. I mean, CO2 was going up and down, but it was always below 420 ppm. Now, we're, al we're already beyond 420 in terms of green total greenhouse gas equivalents, right? CO2 is around 394, 395, but you add in methane and other things, you know, we're, we're above 420. We're not going to stop at 450. We're probably not going to stop at 500 or even 550. I mean, we will very soon, and this means in the next few decades, we will be above a level you know, at which uh, many people working on the physics of ice in Antarctica and coupling that information with the sediment information would say there cannot be stable ice in West Antarctica. I I, and that's my opinion. Uh, what I don't know is, it, you know, I think it is going to melt. Is it going to melt in 100 years? Or probably not. Is it going to melt in... 2,000 years, I think that's a little bit on the long side. It's somewhere in between, and of course, somewhere in between is really important for us, right? Like, we ought to be thinking about 100 years out or 200 years out. So I think that's the last um, real science slide. I guess, um, you know, if you think about what two meters, so only one third of West Antarctica melting. And, I, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, one reasonable scenario is a meter of sea level rise from Antarctica and one meter from Greenland. And, and it does look like that may be possible within the next 100 to 150 years. Two meters all together, you know, it takes out all of the southern part of uh, Louisiana. Um, people tend to think that California, it's a tectonically active area with lots of high elevation, that it's exempt somehow. But, you know, this is 1.4 meters of sea level rise, which is actually a kind of a midstream projection that the Dutch are using right now for the year 2100. This is what 1.4 meters would do. And, you know, we're not too far away from that blue line there. We might actually be in it here at the SETI Institute. Uh, but certainly, you know, there's a lot of uh, very low-lying uh, terrain right next to the bay, particularly in the North Bay region. So we'd see um, tidal inundation, which of course renders those areas useless for, for almost every kind of agriculture. So, you know, these are big things, and, and we'll, we'll see some of these effects. It's way too soon to know, you know, is it going to be one meter, is it going to be two meters, you know, and we're not going to know that for 10 or 20 years, but is it possible and are we heading in that direction? I'd say so. So, um, you know, the very last thing, I mean, a number of people have, have speculated since ClimateGate that, oh, this whole science of climate change and the anthropogenic impact that it's built on 
house of cards, you know, that you knock one of these out, you know, and prove that somebody fudged some data point, you know, one of 10,000 people, that the whole thing's gonna collapse. But, but I was struck by this uh, imagery. This is Mario Molina, a Nobel laureate, and, and he talked about this when he gave congressional testimony in 2010. And he said, you know, the best way to think about uncertainty in climate science today is to think about it as a jigsaw puzzle where, you know, we've only got half the pieces in place. But you know, you know what it is, right? I mean, you know what it is. It's a tiger. And, and sure, maybe that one's not in the right place or that one's not in the right place. We have no clue where that one goes. And you know, there's a whole bunch of pieces there. We don't really know where they fit, but honestly, you know, there are so many different threads coming from tens of thousands of papers worked on by over a thousand scientists that you know, we actually do have a pretty good idea of what the image is gonna be. We just need to figure out how to fit the rest of the pieces in. So I will stop there and leave you with one last cartoon, um, kind of promoting the, the, the non-climate related <laughs> benefits of uh, taking action now. Sorry I've gone on a little bit too long, but thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> That was great. I'm, I'm going to jump in with a quick one. Do we, what, what techniques do we have to measure whether the Ross Ice Shelf is actually disappearing right now? Yeah, okay. So, well, I, I think the most important thing that's going on right now are the, um, the gravity experiments that are satellite-based GRACE, the GRACE uh, mission, which is actively underway now. And, and they actually have produced um, our first kind of large-scale estimates of the loss of ice deflation in both Antarctica and Greenland. And, and the numbers are large and they're accelerating even just in the last 10 years. Um, I actually do, I didn't talk about it, but I make isotopic measurements of the Ross Sea water column. The Ross ice shelf is very depleted in deuterium and O18. And so if you go back along the edge every year and, and measure the isotopic composition, it tells you something about melt rates from uh, the ice shelf. And so far, you know, that data shows an acceleration in melting of the base of the ice on the Ross ice shelf. Uh, on those um, temperature graphs that you had, uh, I didn't see any error bars on the uh, points uh, that were listed there. I mean, there is some wide variation, obviously, in the early 1800s in their second graph. Yeah. But uh, that's understandable technologically. But uh, uh, more recent, uh, you know, uh, measurements. I was just wondering what the, the range yeah, was. Yeah, I didn't. You know, I didn't draw your attention to it. The NASA GIS um, data set that was published um, in the last uh, two weeks did include three green bars that are meant to represent kind of <coughs> epical uh, average error estimates. And they're much bigger prior to 1910 or 1920. Um, they're on the order of um, you know, 0.1 to 0.15 degrees centigrade. I mean, it, it may strike you as odd, but actually we have less, our, our ability to calculate the average temperature of the globe is less today than it was 20 years ago, and that's because there's been a great reduction in the number of MET stations that are maintained in a credible scientific way, particularly in South America and Africa, right? Like when, you know, when the British were doing their thing, when all the colonial powers were there, they had, you know, these just top flight, um, consistent methods for measuring climate. It was important to their economic utilization of their uh, colonies. Um, but, you know, Science has fallen on hard times for a lot of those nations, and, and they're not able to maintain the ground-based observing system. So, I mean, that actually is a really big problem, and it leads to some non-stationarity issues that you know, really got to think about how to address them. A couple of years ago, I heard a talk um, by a fellow from, I guess there's a Florida climate group on the ice cores, correlating uh -huh. CO2 in the ice bubbles to the ice topic record. So, in a way, it's another way of studying correlation between CO2 and temperature change. And I, the gist from that was that, again, as you showed, hundreds of thousands of years of record, they said we've done the CO2 temperature experiment seven or eight times already. We just have to read the record out of these ice cores. And I think they found that CO2 rise isn't what triggered the temperature increases, but it seems to be the ampl an amplifier. Something else starts it, and then you, the CO2 goes up, and then the temperature really takes off. Is that holding up? Is there? Yeah, it's a, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the, you know, the observation that if we're really careful in extracting ice bubbles from co ice cores, you know, and understanding kind of the lock-in time for when 
ice bubbles, you know, how they record atmospheric gases relative to how the ice records temperature, uh, then you can look at leads and lags. And, and um, a couple of things I would say about that, you know, the majority of the glacial to interglacial transitions show a slight lead of CO2 ahead of temperature. Um, that's actually, it's inconsequential for kind of thoughts about global warming because nobody ever said that man-made global warming was causing the end of the ice age, right? I mean, we've known what the, the triggers were for ending ice ages for a long time. We, we know that it are very subtle changes in the orbital geometry, you know, four different factors about the orientation of the, the Earth's orbit and around the sun and, and, um, and where irradiance impacts uh, different latitudinal zones of the Earth, you know. That's been thought as, uh, of, as the, the main cause of the end of the ice ages. The big question was, how do these really small changes in irradiance mediated by these orbital mechanics, you know, how can they manifest as such a large fundamental change going from the depths of an ice age to an interglacial? And so CO2 is invoked as an amplifier there, but not as a trigger, so I mean, it's kind of what you would expect. If that theory holds up, you know, temperature should change first, not CO2. I think there is one interglacial though where it looks like it's the other way around, so you know, that's still pretty complicated. But I would say there are eight major glacial, interglacial cycles that we can recover with ice cores, but you know, that beat in the climate system goes back for tens and hundreds of millions of years. And, and I would say even though we can't measure it directly, the presumption has to be that CO2 is oscillating up and down every time the planet gets warm and cold. I mean, basic thermodynamics tells us that. You know, you make the ocean warm, it can't hold as much dissolved gas, the gas goes into the atmosphere. You know, it's, it's, it's got to be that way through time. Let's see. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, a quick comment and then a, a quick question about this uh, climate warming denier movement. Um, the SETI Institute likes to put these talks on, its, on YouTube and on its seminar series, which is a great service to the community. This is one of the best science seminar series anywhere, your talk included. I enjoyed your presentation. Um, and, and pretty soon Adrian will probably ask you, is it okay to edit your presentation to put it on YouTube? I gave a, a, a talk on a climate-related climate related topic a couple years ago here at the SETI seminar series. No sooner did Adrian edit it and put it on YouTube that it was immediately spammed by a whole bunch of climate deniers who oh, began yeah. uploading nasty comments. So just as a warning, if you agree to that, your talk will probably yeah. collect the same thing. <laughs> and it's an interesting live experiment in this climate debate. Yeah. Uh, so-called climate debate. But my question is this, um, y th these climate deniers, uh, as absurd as they are, they have a very low bar to jump over. All they have to do is convince a lot of the public that it, the science is uncertain. They don't have to convince, you know, people that the science is wrong, just that it's uncertain. So the whole thing drops down on everybody's radar screen. And they have a whole, you know, a whole uh, arrow, arrow, arrow quiver of, of debating tactics to accomplish that. In, in your experience at giving talks, what is, the, um, what is the worst, or among the worst of these tactics, th or the, the most damaging to uh, edu educating the science about the, uh, educating the public about the science? What is, what is the worst you keep hearing from them that does the most damage to people's awareness? Oh, well, boy, you know, well, let me say several things to that. I mean, one, I, I engage with um, people that are skeptical of the data all the time, and, and I try not to, uh, I try to be respectful and use it as a teaching moment wherever I can, refer people back to first principles to the literature, and people want to come meet with me in my office, I enjoy talking to people about this. And I think I've changed a few minds, but I also know of some examples where you know, I haven't. Um, I'd say, you know, in recent years, I mean, it, it's constantly changing. The different arrows are pulled from the quiver at different times. But I think for me, you know, the, the whole climate gate affair and the notion that, um, you know, all this stuff was put up on the web and, and legions of followers could then read all these emails and cherry pick phrases and sentences that seemed to be, uh, you know, a smoking gun for some um, malpractice or some misdeed. And, and, you know, we've had, uh, I think, four major studies now have come in. Uh, people have interviewed the scientists involved and read the emails and, and no evidence of malpractice or malfeasance was found. Um, there were some poor word choices, but you know, these guys thought they were writing emails to each other as colleagues, as professional colleagues, but they also know each other quite well, and maybe they're irritated with some constant freedom of information request, and, and they say something that's not very wise. 
you know, they're, they're guilty of, of um, being rude about other people that are out of earshot in the sense that they think these are private emails, but they're not guilty of many of the things that, that, that the denier movement accuses them of being guilty of. And so I think, to me, you know, the, the notion that we have to throw out all this uh, climate science because of this, um, you know, this email leak that really involves, I don't know, 10 or 15 people out of a community of, you know, many, many hundreds. Uh, um, I think that's one of the worst things I've seen come out. But, um, you know, re related to your comment, I mean, I gave a, a TED talk on climate change in the oceans and, and um, you know, I usually tell myself, don't go read any of the comments, you know. <laughs> but I did and there, there were, you know, it didn't take many days for, for the comment string or all the threads to be dominated by, I think it was four or five different people that were, they were saying the most outrageous stuff about me, you know, and they didn't even know me, you know. <laughs> But other people would come in to my defense, and and uh, the fact is, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty still, and and you know, I like being at Stanford, where we have the Hoover Institution there. I've debated some of those guys on TV on climate change, and you know what? It helps me sharpen my saber. I'm sure it helps them sharpen theirs. But in the process, we actually learn something from each other, right? So I, you know, I feel like I'm better attuned to what arguments are coming down the pike because I engage with that community. And at the end of the day, we're going to figure it out, right? So, I mean, that's what we're all trending towards. Thank you. I, I, I think this is actually an example of a much bigger cultural problem we have, where there's a, there's a, there's a big upsurge of unscience out there. We, we love the supernatural. We love UFOs. We love all these non-science, absurd uh, notions. But there's just an appetite for it. So, anyway, that's just a... Uh, and a side comment, something much, much simpler for you, which is to interpret your temperature graph. Um, you, you pointed out <coughs> a couple of flat periods. Mm -hmm. Are those real, and, and could we learn anything from them? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, at this point, the temperature record coming from thermometers um, has been worked over by so many people trying to find fault or make different kinds of corrections that, yeah, I think that's real. Like, let's say 1940 to 1970. Um, that was a flat period in global temperature rise. In fact, it might have even decreased a very small amount. And, and there's a small literature explaining those. Um, some of them involve changes in ocean heat storage. And I'm an ocean heat guy, so I'm naturally attracted to those explanations. But I mean, you know, if you, if you think about what we're doing to um, the atmospheric circulation system as we change the temperature of the atmosphere and the temperature of the ocean, I mean, we are seeing major changes in the intensity of the winds. Trade winds, it's very well documented now that the westerly wind belt in the region of the Drake Passage is, it's ramped up. That's probably more related to the ozone hole than directly to global warming. But you know, all of these things are happening and all of those things have an, uh, an impact on how the ocean circulates and exchanges heat. So you know, to me, I would look first at oceanic explanations. But, but I would say you know, I'm much less knowledgeable about the aerosol literature, but that community is making great inroads that, you know, we've had industrial things going on that change uh, aerosol and dust concentrations in the atmosphere. Like, let's think about 9-11, you know, one of the more interesting papers that came out, a scientific insight from a big tragedy, you know, was that temperatures in the United States responded almost instantly to the lack of aircraft contrails. Right? There were no airplanes flying for four days, and surface temperatures on in the U.S. went up. And that paper's been published and vetted for some years now. I mean, that just tells you how important things like that are, you know, and, and uh, some of the aerosols that, that we create, you know, um, are going to cause cooling. Um, and you could argue, in, in one of the papers that I'm thinking about, you know, it, it says, well, 1940 to 1970 was when air pollution in increased at this incredibly rapid rate and induced some cooling that worked in opposition to the warming. But there's ocean dynamics explanations that could come in as well. And I mean, we need to figure those out because you know, that will help us tease out the apportionment of you know, forcing to impact of different things that are going on. So. You've got two of them to play with. Yeah, yeah where we really do think, you know, and part of it's going to be the fingerprint, the latitudinal ex expression of, well, where did it get warm? You know, like the, the warming was mostly unabated in, in polar latitudes, so that flattening was mainly a tropical and mid-latitude phenomenon, and that'll help figure out what's the forcing. 
I guess related to the same kind of thought topic we we're talking about. Um, do you have any comments on the Heartland Institute um, conglomeration of scientists that seem to be, you know, somewhat on the opposite side? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, not too much. I, you know, I don't know who's, who's on their uh, playlist these days. I mean, it's the Competitive Enterprise Institute and Heartland Institute and Cato Institute. And I mean, I will say, you know, to the extent that I track what that group's doing, it, it's a pretty small number of names that, that work for all, all of the institutes and tend to be the headliners at the conference that the conferences that they have. You know, I went to Copenhagen for the climate conference, and I was invited there to give a couple of talks on kind of the role of the oceans in climate change, one talk on ocean acidification and these so-called side events. But, you know, while I was there, oh, and we took Stanford students too. That was a learning opportunity for the students. We took about 40 students just so they could see this horrible sausage-making process that is international climate negotiation so they could understand why nothing ever happens. And, um, but, you know, I, I hadn't been aware of this in advance, but there was this counter-conference going on the same time in Copenhagen, you know, this, 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 this other scientific conference on climate change. There were about 100 people in attendance there, and, and I looked down, and it was a very predictable list of people, you know, that, that work with the Heartland Institute, Cato Institute, and so forth. And so they were there to try to get press. Um, and they probably, for their size, 100 people versus 40,000 people at the, at, you know, the big COP conference, you know, they probably had a, an outsized uh, presentation or, or presence in the press. But, you know, I mean, I, I'm a scientist. I tend to I read some of their stuff. Most of it's opinion-based. Um, they, they're, they're not very good at referencing peer-reviewed papers. I go with scientific peer review as the gold standard. Um, that's the community I track, the information stream that I track most carefully. But, but, it, I, but, I, but I look at what they say every now and then just to see, well, what's coming down the pike? You know, is there something we need to, to work on? Or do, mainly, how do we communicate this to the public so that people believe scientists more than <laughs> these other institutes? Now, I'll, I'll leave you with one thought on that. You know, this Yale group that polls people about climate communication, you know, they, they, they did end up polling folks in November. Um, wanting to know who did they trust the most for the acquisition of data or information about climate change. And it was still scientists and scientific societies and organizations, uh, more than political think tanks or economic think tanks or, or non-scientists, right? And, uh, you know, so that's some good news, right? I mean, the American public may not know that much about climate and climate science, but they still trust scientists to give them information on this. Um, but yeah, I mean, in this country, like it is in no other, I mean, it's kind of a war of words and this whole notion of facts being thought of as fungible or being in play as beliefs, you know, it doesn't happen in Europe. <laughs> it doesn't happen in China. It doesn't happen in Japan. And, and certainly, you know, the population in some of those other countries is equally ill-informed about climate, right? I mean, the U.S. is very, very different in this regard. I mean, we could talk about this forever. <laughs> Just have one last uh, question. Let's see. When do uh, the scientists predict the next uh, glacier period to start? Oh, the next ice age. Yes, yeah. without without human effects, <laughs> and then how much are we postponing it due to the yeah. human effects? That's a great question, you know, because people like um, Stephen Schneider, who was at Stanford and passed away a year and a half or so ago. You know, he, he um, started talking about the coming ice age in the 70s, right? And that's been brought up once he became a, somebody talking about global warming. He was reminded that, hey, he used to predict global cooling. And he's not the only one. And, you know, the, the fact is this cyclicity between glacial and interglacial intervals, you know, we think we can identify it in Permian rocks. I mean, it's going back over 200 million years. It's always present on the planet. Uh, but there's a fundamental feature of the transition of the world from a warm period like we are now into the depths of an ice age. It, it happens very slowly. It takes, it takes 90,000 years to go from a warm time to a cold time, but it only takes two to 3,000 years to come out of it to go from a cold time to a warm time, right? So it's very asymmetric. And so, yeah, the Earth is, you know, I think we would normally be tending towards an ice age, but it wouldn't really be upon us for 80 <laughs> or 90,000 years. Are we going to delay it? Probably, you know, let's say the CO2 transient, that the, the fossil fuel CO2 that we put in the atmosphere is going to be there for 
a couple of thousand years, it'll go into the ocean. Maybe 10,000 years from now, it'll all be out as sediments, organic matter and limestones in the sediments. It, it will be scrubbed out of the atmosphere. So maybe we'll delay the ice age a little bit, but 80 or 90,000 years from now, are we going to be in an ice age? Well, unless we've figured out some very clever ways to geoengineer the planet, you know, that's what history would tell us. Yes, we'll be in a, in a state like that. So, um, you know, it's not the kind of thing where you could say, yeah, the next century is protected from the coming of the Ice Age, because the Ice Age can't come on that fast anyway. That'd be the main thing. Okay, if you have any further questions, I'd encourage you to come up and speak to Rob uh, personally. And uh, Rob, we have a special uh, right. Are We Alone mug for... Uh, for um, Perfect. Uh, Late night sessions in the Galapagos, shall we say, or something like that, if we can take Perfect, thanks. Well, you know, now I can prove to my boys that I was here. Right. <laughs> thanks.